Hi, and welcome to Studio Theatrica and the video series The New Normal, Sweets on Corona, and The Silver Lining. Today, I will be speaking with my first guest. His name is Eric Campano, an international master's student attending the University of Umeå. This spring, he launched an online news outlet covering the local news and a particular focus on the corona situation. The outlet is called Umeå Today. I have sent Eric the eight questions. So we will see then what is his perspective, how does he experience the current corona situation and what opportunities does he see? What's the silver lining for him? Hi, Eric. Hey, Otiliana. I am so <laughs> glad that you're here. My first guest on my video <laughs> series, The New Normal, Sweets <laughs> on Corona and the Silver Lining. It's quite Lining. an honor. <laughs> Thank you. So, Eric, you are an international student getting a master at the University of Umeå. Yeah. And uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So I've had the chance to observe the coronavirus crisis very directly in Umeå on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Because just when it started, on March 14th, I created a daily English-language newsletter about the coronavirus crisis in Umeå, which was intended to give information to everybody in the community, those who speak Swedish and those who don't speak Swedish, uh, so that they can protect their families uh, and themselves better uh, during this time. And uh, the newsletter continues to today, um, and it's been a fantastic experience. And what is it called? It's called Umeå Today. And, and what, what have you learned from that process? So much. <laughs> About the coronavirus, I have learned that we in, in Umeå and in Vesterbotten, in this county, have been quite lucky in terms of the toll it's taken on our on residents and on the healthcare system. Mm. So uh, in other parts of Sweden, uh, as everybody talks about internationally, uh, the coronavirus has had a pretty rough impact, for example, on Stockholm. Uh, up here in Vesterbotten, our death rate per capita is actually comparable to that of our neighboring countries, Denmark, Norway, and Finland. Um, that's despite the fact that we didn't put in strong legal restrictions uh, like those countries did. So uh, one fascinating question that scholars, I think, in our area will be discussing for a long time to come is why did coronavirus not hit Umeå with the kind of strength that it hit Stockholm? Um, so that's one thing I've been learning uh, as I've been doing this paper. I've been learning about the dynamics of the disease within unity. Mm -hmm. yeah. That actually leads me to jump in the, the eight questions that I yeah. have for you. Sure. I'm actually going to jump to number five yeah. as you spontaneously started to speak about this very uh, important point. Yeah. And question number five is what do you think about Sweden's approach to handling the pandemic and the crisis? Well, first of all, I do not have the answer to the question of what is the best way to handle a pandemic. I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, I'm a journalist. Uh, so I don't have a strong opinion on whether what Sweden has done is right or whether it's wrong. But I have been able to observe it closely at a local level. And, and I have been able to, uh, I have had access on a daily basis to national statistics and the arguments for and against Sweden's approach. Now, as you know, Sweden decided not to put strong laws into place about where people could move and when they could leave their apartment, unlike other European and countries and countries outside of Europe where uh, we had lockdowns. Yeah. So nonetheless, statistics from all places of Google who, who are able to track the location of uh, uh, mobile phones um, 
have shown that Swedes and particular people in Umeå and in Västerbotten have lived out the guidelines, not the legal restrictions, but the guidelines that the government has put into place to about an 80 to 90 percent uh, level. Of, mm -hmm. I mean, 80, 90, 80 to 90 percent of people have been, have been doing what the government has said uh, they should do. Um, and that may be one of the reasons that here in Westerbotten, the disease hasn't been such a burden on the healthcare system. Uh, on the other hand, and I've had a lot of really interesting uh, uh, art, uh, discussions with my friends uh, abroad about this, uh, we at the newspaper have over and over again witnessed and reported upon people violating these guidelines, packing themselves into restaurants, huge parts of young people with, you know, like 100, 120 kids together, all uh, within coughing distance of one another, you know. Um, uh, also on sunny days, people packed together like sardines in, in the little rays of sunshine that hit the city center and so on. Um, and what's been interesting about that is um, uh, uh, is that uh, if you, people say, Eric, are people behaving well in in Umeå, right, with regards to, to the coronavirus. And I guess their question is really, are people maintaining social distance, right? That's what they want to know. And if I extrapolate what we have seen anecdotally, and I imagine that people were behaving that way in a big city like Stockholm or Milan, which was hit really hard, or New York, which was hit really hard. I'm not really sure that the behavior of people here is any better than the behavior of people in those cities. Uh, I think we have more space here, naturally. We are more isolated. And as a result, even if people don't maintain social distancing, they still are able to kind of keep the disease uh, from spreading quickly. Very interesting. So uh, question number one yeah. for you, Eric, is uh, how has the corona crisis, the corona, I have my uh, cheat, sheet, cheat, cheat sheet here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, how has the corona, how has the current coronavirus crisis changed the way you live and are there any positive changes you plan to integrate into your life more permanently? <laughs> yes, actually, it's funny. A lot of people have had a tough time during this coronavirus crisis, and understandably so, because they've been isolated, often isolated from their loved ones, friends and family. For me, actually, coronavirus isolation has been an emotionally positive experience. Um, uh, Working from home and doing this newspaper has been so enjoyable. Uh, first of all, my workplace is super comfortable. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here in, in what we call the newsroom <laughs> for the newspaper. Um, and I'm surrounded by three television sets and two computer screens. Um, and I've got a big recliner chair that I bought at Ikea, uh, which is super soft and comfy. And I just plant myself in that chair and I work all day. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have to get all dressed up and I don't have to commute. So it actually, the coronavirus crisis for the work that I'm doing, it's saved time mm -hmm. for me. And, um, and it's allowed me to create a comfortable place so that I can work long hours. And Otiliana, I have been working long hours. Um, uh, th the newspaper is not, uh, a small project. I mean, we're talking about at least eight hours, often 10, 12 hours of work a day to get to keep the thing going. Um, and on top of that, I'm writing a master's thesis. <laughs> so so I, um, I need a good place. Um, I like isolation. Uh, I like cooking for myself. Uh, I like the, um, I like the comfort of being at home. And also, we're talking about me personally, and I want to talk about everybody, but since you've asked the question, mm -hmm. I am uh, I'm, I'm born out of um, a value system which really emphasizes simplicity, right? 
um, yeah, I grew up into this religious Roman Catholic environment. It was very anti-materialistic. Um, and when I was much, much younger, I even considered becoming a priest. And the poverty, which is one of the things that Roman Catholic priests have to embrace, that doesn't bother me, living without much stuff, right? So the coronavirus crisis, in a way, has allowed me to, with social sanction, live simply. Nobody, you know, nobody asks me, Eric, why aren't you out at restaurants? Why aren't you spending a lot of money? Why aren't you buying all kinds of fancy stuff? Because you're not supposed to be doing that stuff, right? So I don't have to excuse this kind of like anti-materialistic lifestyle to people uh, in my life. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's been really beneficial. Having said that, though, I know isolation is definitely not for everybody. And we've reported on a lot of people who have had it really tough psychologically through the, uh, through the crisis. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It's so interesting to hear you speak about all of these things. It's, it's just absolutely uh, uh, wonderful and insightful, as well as also recognizing the toll that it's taken on, on some people that have a harder time dealing with it. Yes, yes. And with that said, do you feel fear or safe and or hopeful in what I am I feel safe for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I am hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that Umio and that Vesterbot will get through this crisis with with as little as low a, uh, a mortality toll as as really we can expect, given the seriousness of coronavirus. So about that, I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm also hopeful that Sweden, America, the rest of the world, that we are learning lessons from this crisis about better ways to live, mm -hmm. you know? Um, People have been forced to stay at home with their families. They've been forced to not go shopping, right? They've been forced to spend more time with their kids, right? They've been forced to cherish their relationships with their grandmothers and grandfathers and great grandmothers and great grandfathers because they can't just visit them automatically, right? Um, they have been forced to. Uh, uh, consider the importance of people in their lives who live at a distance, right? So we're right now we're kind of in the age of Zoom, right? <laughs> and so many conversations are now taking place over the internet, you know? And I've always been a little bit suspicious of digital technology and in, in the ways that it hurts communication between people because there's nothing like being in the same room as, as another person. And I think that text messaging can be really problematic because there's a lot of meaning that gets lost when you don't have facial expressions, you don't have tone of voice. But this shift from primarily text messaging to primarily video conferencing, I think that that may be a real breakthrough in the way that we communicate electronically, right? This conversation that you and I are having right now, it contains a lot of the elements of a face-to-face -face conversation. Right. I can read your facial expressions, I can I can hear your tone of voice, right? Um, and uh, and so I feel like I'm getting ninety ninety five percent of what I would be getting if you and I happen to be sitting in a, in a coffee shop right now. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it's even better because there are fewer distractions, right? There's yeah. no <laughs> there's no waiter rushing by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's I think no, it becomes very focused. It's like it's like pure and focused somehow, yeah, yeah. not to say, of course, it's wonderful when, when we get to, to see one another, one is yeah. in the same room, share yeah. an experience in, in yeah. another type yeah. of way, but uh, this works. I mean, this is a wonderful communication tool. I agree. Um, on the other hand, that's coming from a person who has spent time on camera, also professionally, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I do understand that... Um, some people really have difficulty with video conferencing. I've, I've heard of, and, and in fact, I have a member of my family who's like this, right? Uh, they feel that there's a kind of pressure in video conferencing. It's just you and the other person. 
and you sort of have to talk <laughs> and, and there's no distraction at all. There, there's no excuse not to talk, right? And for some people that can put, place a kind of burden or pressure on them to keep the conversation going when they may not really have anything of substance to say. Yeah. Um, so it goes both ways. Uh, it's been great for me, but um, I've also had to learn uh, that uh, it's not as comfortable a thing for everybody else. And, and so for those of us for whom it's not a problem, we have to make sure that we're, we're being compassionate with people who have difficulty uh, with electronic forms of, of communication. That's very wise and sweet of you to mention that. It's, it reminds me too of, you know, like you have mentioned, you know, Umeå is part of the county of Västerbotten and yes. it's quite rural, uh, many small towns and villages and so on. And at uh, my father's homestead in Ötresk in Västerbotten, where I love to yes. be, and, and uh, I always, when I, I lived in the U.S. for 18 years, right? So when I came back home in the summertime, I would spend a lot of time in our country home. And then I would walk around to the neighbors, you know, the farm, uh -huh. you know, like on, on the land next two hours and so on. And I would just go over there, knock on their door, and they would invite me in for a coffee. And we would sit down at the kitchen table. And many of these are old people, you know, and they would, you know, speak about, whatever they wanted to to share with me and me, me with them as well but there was a calm around it because of course we could sit by the by the kitchen table not talking sometimes yes. we would just sit there and sip our coffee yeah. look out the window uh -huh. maybe you know do some kind of vocal sound like mm, mm -hmm, mm. yeah like yeah. this you know yeah. Yeah. and yeah. it was very sweet that of course is Diff more difficult to do in a video conference or Zoom or yeah. Skype to have yes. that nat naturalness of space of silence and just presence. And I like the way you brought it up in the context of visiting your, your family in the countryside in Sweden because there are cultural differences going on here. Uh, Sweden, I think our audience is probably aware, uh, puts a lot of value on silence between people who are physically present. There's this mm -hmm. expression that tisna der guld, I think. Yeah. Can I say it right? Uh, tisna der guld. Yeah, tisna yeah. der guld. Silence is gold. Silence is gold, right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, uh, whereas that's def definitely not true in some other cultures. Um, I don't know about where you lived in the United States. I guess California is, is a pretty friendly place. Mm -hmm. um, New Yorkers are famous for being very chatty. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, my family cannot be cannot be silent together ever. If they're if we're in the room, they're always talking. Um, as, I mean, I, and I'm not using hyperbole here. Like it's literally true. There's basically always there's basically I can't even remember a time when my family has been together in the same room and in silence. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I moved here from a, a place. That's also very chatty. The last place I lived was was Italy, Milan, actually, which was terribly hit by this. Illness, you know, and and the Milanese are so communicative that they get out on their balconies and they start making music and talking to each other because <laughs> they can't stand being alone in their apartments and just being silent. You know? Yeah. So big cultural differences. Uh, I also right. lived in Japan, um, and Japan is more like Sweden. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Okay, so uh, question number three is, yeah. what do you miss most from before the crisis? And what do you think is needed to make that feel safe for you to enjoy again? Oh, good question. Uh, parties. Yeah. I love parties. Uh, and we haven't had any recently. Although... I have gone barbecuing with friends a couple times out on Lake Nudala. Um, and, uh, and that's been super fun because we all jump around and dance and have a good time. But uh, there's no replacement for the house party or for the dinner party. Yeah. Um, and that's what I miss the most, uh, for sure. And um, uh, does that come with a feeling of lack of safety? In a way, it kind of does. Otiliana, I mean, I think your question is, is pregnant with uh, a lot of meaning in this way because, um, you know, it's what, when I get together with a whole 
bunch of people and we have a good time together. When that's over, I go to bed that night and I say, okay, I have a community, right? Like a group, right? That, that I know all these people, they at least tolerate me, <laughs> right? I'm not sure if they, if they like me or love me all the time, but they tolerate me, you know? And, um, and uh, especially when you're a, a, a foreigner or an immigrant in a society, it's really important to know that you have social support. Because if you hit a crisis of some kind, right, mm -hmm. uh, then somebody's there for you. I mean, I woke up this morning with a sore throat, as I mentioned to you before this interview, and I called 1177 and they said, Eric, you should stay home in Swedish. And um, luckily I have a friend in the building who's going to go do my shopping for me, who's also not native Swedish. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we support each other. But before coronavirus crisis hit, uh, he and I, we party probably once every two weeks, every three weeks together, brought all our friends together and had a good time. But I have to admit, and I didn't tell him this, and he'll, he'll learn it when he sees this interview maybe, <laughs> but I was a little shy this morning texting him and saying, hey man, can you go to the grocery store for me? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because the, the, the indication of support and community and solidarity, the constant indication of solidarity, is missing when you don't have regular physical meetings with your friends or groups of people. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, I, and I don't think necessarily that that can be replaced by like Zoom parties. We've tried a couple of those, but I don't know, dancing around and shifting from person to person and having small side conversations, it's all very difficult. Um, yeah. So we talked earlier about the advantages of electronic communication, but here I think we're still at a disadvantage. There's no way of replacing a party that I see yet. Despite lots of attempts, there's no way of replacing an in-person party electronically using video conferencing. It may be that this contrast will make us value it in a completely different way when we are able to be near and not take it for granted as we have done. Yeah, me, me and my somebody, my partner that I live with, we had an after work, uh, uh, you know, get together with two friends of ours, another couple who they are from southern Sweden, but they bought a little uh, a couture hotel in Spain, uh -huh. America, at the sun coast of Spain. Ooh, sounds nice. And yeah, beautiful. And they were stuck there, right? Oh. And, okay. and they just bought the business and they had to send everyone home and it was a challenging time, but they're still using it. They are fixing up the whole place. They are yeah. taking care of every single room, the facade, everything. But then we had an, an after work with them on Skype yeah. and it was it was wonderful. We got to see how it looked there <laughs> yeah. around for a tour and so on. But of course, we wanted to be there. It yes. was just but it was like cute. It was like a sweet, cute thing to be able to do, but nothing that ever, ever would, you know, be able to exchange the experience we will have when we are able to go and visit them. Yeah. Of yeah. course, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, hopefully soon you will. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you having many, many dance parties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So moving on. Uh, what will the new normal look like and how yeah. do you intend to contribute to that? Great question. Um, look, I, I cannot predict the future. Uh, and this virus, while uh, it's, I believe it's past its, at least past its first peak in Umeå, it is raging in some parts of the world. And, uh, uh, and I mean, we, we have to feel, especially for people in uh, countries, in poorer countries, uh, uh, in industrializing countries, uh, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, we have to feel for the, the, um, the amount of, 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 of damage this is going to do, you know, both medically and, and psychosocially on, on those places. Um, so. Um, the, the, the global story of coronavirus is not 
even beginning to be told, right? So it's very hard to project and say, okay, well, this is what the new normal is going to become around the world. But I do think that in Umeo, a couple things are going to be new. One thing is we have um, learned that we can keep some aspects of our economy and our lives going through online technology, right? So the university, for example, has moved all its classes online um, and with relative success. Now, there was a study that was put by the student union a couple days ago, which said that students are less satisfied at the university, especially undergraduates, with their education now through distance learning than they were when before the coronavirus hit. Okay, so um, um, so it's 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 not necessarily better, or, or it's not necessarily a replacement or equivalent to in-person meetings. But we know we can do it, right? We know that society doesn't collapse all of a sudden when everybody is required to stay at home. But and when you think about it, just parenthetically, that's really interesting because if we had had these stay-at-home orders in say nineteen. Uh, 94, right? Before we had the internet, imagine how much more the impact would have been, right? Mm -hmm. on our lives. Um, and, and, I'm, and I think that's probably what a lot of people experienced in other pandemics, like, uh, you know, the 1918 mm -hmm. uh, flu, right? Which, you know, really devastated Europe and its economy and its population. Um, so, so I think the new normal is going to, incorporate a lot more of online communication. People are going to keep what's good about this, right? Um, and uh, 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 so, that, so that's one aspect of the new normal. I hope that the new normal will include an increased environmental awareness. That climate change is a problem that has been with us for 40 years now, right? I mean, they were talking about it when you and I were kids, right? Uh, and progress on climate change has been so poor relative to what it could have been. And I, I, know, I realize I'm getting political and I don't really like to do that as, as a journalist, but I, I think that what I'm saying here is, 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 is pretty fair. I mean, I think what I'm saying is, 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 a, is an opinion which... which uh, a large majority of very informed people have, which is that we could be doing better with environmentalism, right? And the, the coronavirus crisis is almost like the strike of lightning, right? You know, which hit us all and said, you know what? Nature is extremely powerful and we have to band together as a group in order to protect ourselves when it becomes dangerous, right? Um, and the lesson of coronavirus is that if, if we just leave people individually to deal with large scale natural uh, dangers to the community, then uh, we end up with chaos and, 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 and destruction, right? And what I'm hoping is that that communal ethic, which has been better or worse in various countries, right? My hope is that, commu that communal ethic will be applied to other environmental problems that we're facing above all climate change, because I think that's the most dangerous, but other ones as well, like pollution, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, like the damage we're doing to our oceans, for example, right? Uh, uh, if I have like a sort of dream for big social change that comes out of the pandemic, that's my dream. Uh, 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 and, and enlarged consciousness uh, about the importance of taking action on, on major environmental issues. Word, Eric, word. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, you know, humans yeah. are fucking creatures. Some, sometimes they learn lessons from what happened and sometimes they learn... They don't learn a lesson and sometimes they do the opposite of what they should do. Right. So we'll yeah. see. This leads into then uh, 
a couple of questions. One, how do you use technology to get around the situation? Is And is there any keepers for the future? We have touched upon this a little bit, but maybe to, to sum up that part of the, the conversation. Yeah, I definitely video conferencing is a keeper, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, also, um, home delivery ah. is a keeper. Uh, uh, you know, we put a lot of burden on our seniors to go shopping and to get out there. And uh, there wasn't a good enough retail infrastructure until now to, uh, to help seniors kind of make it through their day, even in very sort of like advanced countries like Sweden with regards to the way that we treat seniors. Right. Um, so I, I think that, uh, and also because of the toll, that this disease has taken particularly on, on seniors and above all those living in, in, in nursing homes and elderly care. Right. Uh, I think hope, I, I think that one takeaway from this experience is that we, we need to be better for, for, for pensioners and, and for retired people and for the most vulnerable older people in our community. Beautiful. I think that's a keeper. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then two more questions. Uh, do you see people in groups using the current crisis as an opportunity to create new or better systems in some kind of way? If so, how? Perhaps it tags along on what you just spoke of. Well, yeah, but it, you're absolutely, yeah, seniors for sure. Um, uh, but we've reported on so many fantastic projects in Umeå Um that arose from this uh, process. So one that jumps to mind immediately is the We Stick Together project at the Westerbunds Museum. Uh, that along with another documentation project that they're doing where, uh, where they're, so there's, there's a group, there are people all over the city who are making patches for a quilt, a memorial quilt which is going to be constructed and then displayed, they expect, in the Westerbot Museum as a testament to life under the pandemic. Um, uh, and uh, so that's one example. And then when I think about other community organizations in Umeå during the pandemic, Vene Umeå is a great example uh, where they've figured out ways to get people together, uh, like with like group walks, they've created scavenger hunts throughout the city. <laughs> so people could go out and, and, and do stuff without, without having to risk coronavirus spread. Uh, Vavin and the Stad Bibliothek and the whole uh, uh, Umeå cultural uh, sort of, uh, the wing of the cultural wing of Umeå Kommun, uh, the city of Umeå, um, they've come up with some very creative ways of distributing entertainment content, uh, like with their Care of Vavin, Care of Vavin Live series, um, where they bring music to people, uh, music, local musicians, local poets, uh, local spoken word artists. They, they bring their work directly to people's homes. You know, it's one really fascinating thing about this virus is it's hit artists hard, and there's no... There's no doubt about that, right? I mean, when an economy starts faltering, unfortunately, art is one of the the, the segments that 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 usually gets 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 lost in the shuffle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, first, but we we have some very enterprising artists here in Umeå and, and and of course everywhere around the world, and they had through this crisis found new ways to distribute their content. Um, and I hope that that continues. I hope that even after the pandemic is over, that I can log into my computer in the morning and see a performance by one of the local bands or one of the local theater companies. Right. Um, uh, so hopefully that will be part of the new normal. That's so exciting. <laughs> 
That's really so exciting. Yeah. 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 Okay, Eric, the last question yeah. is, is there a silver lining in this crisis in your own life and globally? Uh, and you yeah. touched upon this, but then in, in, to sum it up, perhaps. Yeah, okay, to sum it up. So the silver lining in this crisis. For me, the silver lining has been um, doing this newspaper. I call it a newspaper sometimes. I call it a newsletter sometimes. It's sort of in between. Uh, because it has allowed me to do detailed, intimate local journalism and really get to know the city uh, at, a, uh, at, at, a, at a granular level, right? So I've had a chance to, to meet the, the political leaders, meet the business leaders, uh, many of them, I mean, not all, but most, and uh, meet leaders in other areas like arts and media and sports, right? And um, so in my own personal life, uh, the crisis has, has drawn me closer to all these 130,000 people that I'm surrounded with. That's the population of Umiyo Kumun. Uh, uh, because we have to, we have to draw together. We have to get, we have to support each other. Um, and and um, and so the Umio Today project, um, I hope, has been a, a small, a small piece of that puzzle. Right. Uh, what's the global silver lining? Um, yeah, it, it's like we said earlier. It's tough because we don't know the global outcome, right, of the disease. Um, um, I hope, like we said, that it's uh, it's increased our environmental awareness and our our our, our understanding that we're dependent upon each other. Um, uh, and um, and I hope that it has boosted medical research. Right, um, uh, you know. Uh, when when medical crises come along, I, I think of like the AIDS crisis, for example, and how much research that spawned, you know, not only in the, the prevention and treatment of AIDS, but also, you know, all the side research that that went into, right? Um, I hope that, that the amount of work that's being put into coronavirus will also be applied to other areas. Uh, I think especially genetic engineering technology, which people are looking at as a means of combating the virus and preventing it. Um, and uh, and we, we really, it, it, uh, from a public health perspective, we really needed to put more resources and much more of a push into genetic engineering. And so that's one area that's now getting what it deserves, I think. And, and that'll have great benefits across the spectrum of human disease. Um, I, it's, to sum this, I'd like to so sum this up is um, I think that there is actually a, a, a musical, a piece of musical theater, which is a lot like the coronavirus crisis. Are you familiar with Into the Woods, the musical by Stephen Sondheim? Yes. Okay. So for our, for our, our audience, to sum it up in a couple sentences, it has two acts and it's about fairy tales. And the, in the first act, all these different fairy tale characters, they go out and they, they wish for something and they get what they wish. And at the end of the first act, there's this happy ending. And then comes act two. And what happens in act two is that giants who are living in the sky come over, come down and they start destroying the village where all these fairy tale characters were living their happy lives. And all of a sudden, they have to together contend with this terrible phenomenon, which is a, a danger to their entire community. And the second act is all about how they have to put their own individual wishes behind them so that they can work together as a group. And this is extremely powerful and moving and profound because they face some really existential questions. Like if my wishes don't really matter, why am I fighting this in the first place? And 
one of the main characters runs from the situation. A whole bunch of characters get killed as they're trying to, to, to fight these giants. Um, and the, the end of the musical has a sort of sadder but wiser feel mm-hmm. to it. Um, and, and I wonder sometimes if the way that our society is dealing with the pandemic is, is kind of a process like that. Like, mm-hmm. Economically, things were rolling along pretty nicely. Um, in, 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 in Europe and then in the industrialized world. And now often this thing hit and we're going to see mass unemployment, you know, and, um, and a lot of the support systems that we had before are not going to be there. Um, so I feel like we're kind of like in the middle of act two right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm into the woods, you know, and, uh, and I'm wondering if, if our, our play, if our piece of theater will end also in it, maybe a sadder but wiser place uh it might very it might very well have such an ending that then of course will have its own continuation and be the beginning of something else and what a wonderful place to end this conversation and interview with you eric with uh an example of how art does reflect and correspond with life and vice versa. And yeah. even though uh, art at this point perhaps is like taking a back seat because other things are so extremely um, uh, fatal and has to be like an, an urgent and, pri- uh, over and prioritized, is that still uh, we of course cannot live here on earth without nature or without art. Yes. Well, art is so crucial right now because it helps people to deal emotionally with the crisis. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. So if you just hold on, Eric, uh, yeah. don't go anywhere, and then I will just okay. wrap it up, and then okay. you and I can say goodbye to each other. Sure. Anyway, I just want to say uh, thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you, everyone, that has been watching this conversation and interview and I will continue to invite interesting people like Eric to see what their perspective is, the opportunities they see and the possible silver lining with the current corona pandemic. Thank you so much everyone. Yeah, thank you Atelia. Thank you for the really interesting questions. Yeah, you're welcome. In the next episode, I'm going to interview Elin Hagelberg, who is a really interesting multi-artist, or like she calls herself, a jack of all trades within the cultural field, also currently living and working here in Umeå, northern Sweden. As an active member in the creative cooperative Jack Studios, she's engaged in giving creatives in Umeå a platform to express themselves during the corona crisis. Until then, stay sound and safe. Remember, this is our time.